Joining us now is Mishana Hosseinian, who is Program Director of the International Convention on Human Rights, which is a nonprofit dedicated to human rights and education and drafting of a legally enforceable human rights document for the new millennium. What, uh, what we talked about in preparing for the program, <clears throat> and I read the, uh, everything you gave me, Sorry. is that you see this as the potential Supreme Court of the world, where, where countries would submit cases like we submit mm -hmm. to the Supreme Court. This is something you believe in. I believe in it because currently we don't have any such enfor enforcement mechanism to deal with uh, the human rights epidemic. So um, this would act as, as, a, as a legal legal sort of uh, means of taking care of all the symptoms that we're now just treating by, you know, through our organization, nonprofit organizations. This would be a, a way of getting at the root. It would be, and, uh, and in fact, it has a long history because in your, in, your, in your booklet, you have three phases of yes. this. Tell us about the three phases of this. We want people to sort of see where they fit in within this continuum, this evolution of human rights documents, beginning with uh, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, which was signed just right across from us here in San Francisco, and um, moving on to the European Convention on Human Rights, which is uh, what we are modeled after, only that we are expanding it to include all 191 countries, not just 45. And, and, there, and, and that European model yes. is handing down binding uh, judgments for the 41 countries that have subscribed to it. 45. 45 countries. All cases that have been brought to the European Court of Human Rights have been uh, successful. So it's, it's a wonderful precedent for us to look back to. And uh, so this is nothing new. This is just uh, building on what has been uh, shown to be a success in the past. You know, and, and you're fully aware that the debate in this country is just about whether or not the Supreme Court of the United States should even look at and, uh, the, the laws of other countries. Mm -hmm. Ruth Ginsburg uh, has uh, advocated for it, and the, the more conservative groups yes. say that we shouldn't even look outside the country at uh, any other country's laws. We have a, uh, the Constitution. You know, Mr. Brizzoni, this is not this is not even about those kind of debates. This is a matter of humanity. This is what is at in our hearts, at our in our sort of fundament. Uh, this is talking about the human rights that we all share. So we cannot look at the laws of the United States without realizing the consequences that they have internationally. We are living in an increasingly globalized world, and we cannot think of ourselves as an insular unit. Well, that's so. <laughs> the ideal, uh, and that's the point. That's one of the reasons why I wanted to have you. Uh, we just had Jack Hirschman, yes. and I think you saw that interview. Yes. Here's a man who's uh, 72, uh, a committed uh, communist, in the, uh, let's, and I don't like to use labels. He's committed to the total redistribution of wealth mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, you know, a, and honestly and sincerely believes that no matter what's happening in the world. And I thought that in your case, mm -hmm. you too have that same idealism that Jack had when he was your age. And what do you think will happen to you over the next 20 or 30 years as you watch the world unfold? Do you think this commitment you have and the belief that this can be done will waver any, or do you think that y at, at some point, you know, reality hits and uh, you accept that it can't happen? Well, you know what? I think I, I am thinking about reality. In fact, I, I want to sort of stray away from thinking about things that are not realistic. This is talking about something very realistic because it's what we are. What we are. And um, if, we can, if we can stop looking at the politics behind it and really look at it as you, know, you and me and everyone else as being the same uh, despite our differences, then that's, that's what I want to look at. And indeed, let, let's, for those who are not familiar with yes. the, the United Nations Declaration of Human Rights, when you go through these rights, these are the rights we do believe in. Mm -hmm. Everything from free speech to free association, uh, freedom. Uh, there, there's only one area that I do want to talk about. Sure. It really implies a freedom from poverty. Yes. It freedom from want, freedom from fear. Yeah, and, and also the right to housing and the right to an education. Yes. Uh, and then your recommendations include a 1%, not tax, mm -hmm. but every country would have to give 1% of their gross national product to yes. support this. Yes. How do you think that will go over among our self-centered Americans that are concerned about the taxes they pay now? 
You know, I'm really looking to the future. I'm, I'm almost saying it's too late to worry about working on the, the current generation. Let's worry about the younger generation. You know, that's something I want to, <laughs> in fact, the Board of Supervisors here in San Francisco and your boss, yes. Gavin Newsom, uh, they're in their 30s and, uh, and, and, and that's one of the reasons I want to also have you on. First of all, we're the boss and they're, they're working for us. Yeah, they right? are working, yeah. good point. Yeah. Do, you, do you tell Gavin that from time to time? You know, I don't. I think he's working really hard, so um, just whatever to make it easier for him. I think that it's really our job, our job as citizens, mm -hmm. to to kind of to tell government what we want from them. So this this process, this organization, this sort of en endeavor is really uh, founded in the belief that citizens should voice their opinions because they know what they how they should be ruled. So now there's one generation. Yes. The 30s, the 30-somethings, yes. and you're just entering the 20-somethings. Mm -hmm. How do you look at that generation, the, the ones who now occupy the Board of Supervisors and the Mayor's Office, do you see them as aged and, and somewhat jaded, or do you think they, and they would accept your idealism mm -hmm. and positive and yes. optimistic view? I, I don't personally see that they, in their, the way they handle themselves, they, would, uh, they don't have as much uh, spirit about what you believe in. But how do you look at that generation, which is only you know, 10 or 15 years ahead of you? I tell them to look at the younger generations. Uh, and I think that that in and of itself can give them hope because if they look to kids in primary and secondary schools, uh, they will, they will, I mean, I, I can't, just imagine looking at, looking to younger kids, asking them, just as we did um, on Human Rights Day, asking them uh, what they believe human rights are, for example, how they think a city should be run. And by doing that, I think that this cross-generational dialogue that is that emerges really uh, injects a lot of energy and excitement into uh, you city government. You think the, the the younger generation, and, and even in high school, and and certainly at at uh, University of California where you are, do you think that they are as optimistic as you are? You know, um, I I I would say that a lot of people are not optimistic, and that has a lot to do with how they're how they're raised, uh, what kind of parenting they're um, they're being brought up under, what kind of schools they go to. So. Uh, Really, what I want to say is that all of us have, uh, it's our responsibility to work within our family units. Uh, that's where we can make the, the biggest impact because basically if all of us uh, agree to take care of ourselves, to take care of our own children, we are doing our part essentially for, for the rest of the world. But you do see, uh, you don't see an, a flooding or, uh, of, of idealism and optimism at the University of California in your class and on your campus at this point that that share your your vision well I think that um, we need to open up the space to talk about uh, the, the feasibility the compatibility between idealist uh, idealistic philosophies and practice such as in legal legally enforceable mechanisms mm -hmm. um, so it's about seeing the compatibility not looking the, at at idealistic views as something intangible, but look finding ways to, to really bring them about. When you look around the world right now, do you do you see a resurgence of interest and commitment to human rights by countries that have been formerly, you know, brutal and certainly did not in, include these ideals in their constitutions? What, yeah. Where's the where's it going sure. internationally right now, as you see it? Right now, I think it's really continuing on. If we look at history as uh, from afar, it's really continuing sort of on the same path. Uh, of course, we have had wonderful movements uh, that have that seem to have changed the flow of history. We're essentially on the same path. So, um, what I'm asking us to do is really step outside of the discourse that we're in, step outside of the political discourse that we're so used to and that really is so becomes so distracting uh, from looking at the, the larger picture of, you know, this is about our humanity. This is about what me and you and everybody else in the world needs, whether it's food on our tables at night, clean water to drink, everybody hands down will need that. How does Mishana yes. look at San Francisco? The, the San Francisco 
San Francisco, which prides itself in being so different from the rest of the country, do you see that justice? Do you see that uh, uh, those ideals you believe in being practiced here? Well, just as I said, I, I see the potential for them to be practiced within, within every household. Yeah, you saw, yes. you listened to Jack Hirschman when he was reading that remarkable poem on homelessness, yes. and I gather he himself was homeless at one point. Uh, when you look As he says, we are all homeless. We are all homeless. Even but I, I think the people he was talking about, the ones that, that meet the boot in the morning that he mentioned, mm -hmm. uh, how do you view the behavior and performance of the board in, with relation to these social issues like homelessness? Are you, are you satisfied with it? Um, you know, it's not a matter of being satisfied or unsatisfied. That's not the issue. Uh, it's, you know, we, we look at these things, we, we're looking for um, tangible results, right, at the Ye end of the day. Yeah. And uh, there's a lot of debate that happens around this, and we really lose track of what we're talking about. But there's a human, there are human beings involved here. There are human beings, but a lot of the time, a, a lot of the time, uh, the human beings, by, by virtue just debating a lot uh, and getting into this political mm -hmm. bickering, mm -hmm. we lose track of the humanity. But what I'm asking you is, yes. let's, let's divorce ourselves from all the political... Uh, the, we can't. That's what, the reality. But uh, for the people who live in the Bayview, yes. uh, in fear of, of gang uh, gunshots in the middle of the night, for the people who are, uh, who are mentally uh, uh, disabled in San yes. Francisco or on drugs and are living in the streets, that's tangible. That's real. That doesn't of have course it is. So what, how do you view it? Is the city more more or less better than other cities in handling the kinds of things you're talking about? We are all um, maybe in varying degrees in the same thing together, whether it's uh, San Francisco or any other city across the globe. Are you, satis though? Are you satisfied that, that at least we've begun at home to Im use these values that are part of the Declaration of Human Rights? And, or do you feel that there's even violations here in San Francisco? Not until we look at real, uh, tangible enforcement mechanisms to take care of these problems, rather than treating them after they well, already happen. I think one thing you've said in the past, it's just important that some people yes. are saying what you're saying, because so many other people are so negative, and there's so much political static. So I wish you well, Nishana Hussein. Thank you so much. Thank you. And uh, thank you for joining us. We'll see you next time. For program schedules, post-production notes, and free streaming video of select interviews, visit our website at www.sfunscripted.com.